graphics. They're an important feature of any game. They are the visuals that immerse players into new worlds, tell stories, and even convey mechanics. A major component graphics are the post-processing effects, and if Unity's provide a post-processing stack, it has never been easier to apply such effects to your own game in a free and effective way. With that being said, every indie developer working with Unity should be aware of these features and should utilize them to enhance their game. In this tutorial, I'll cover how to set up the older version and the current 2.0 version of the post-processing stack. I'll also explain the various effects we have at our disposal, and we will finally end using what we have learned to enhance the visuals of our own scene. If you would like to skip to a specific section in the video, I have left links in the description below. Alright, so let's install the older version of the post-processing stack. To do that, simply navigate to the asset store up here. If this tab doesn't appear for you, you can simply go to Window, General, Asset Store, or Control 9 for a shortcut. But I've already got the tab here, so I'm just going to click that. And go into the search bar and just type Post Pro, that should be enough. And there we go, it's the second one here. You'll know if it's the right one if it has that logo there and the Unity Technologies underneath. So click on that. Alright, so here's the page. If you haven't downloaded it before, this button here will say Download. Simply click that. Once that is done, it will change to Import like I've got here. Simply click on that. So what this is doing is just getting all the assets ready and just click import again and that will put them into your project. Alright so mine's now installed, you can see here I have the folder called post processing. Now we're actually almost done so simply go back to your scene and click on your main camera. And go to add component down here and type post pro and we're just going to click on the post processing behavior. Now you can see here there's asking for a profile. The profile is actually what has all the parameters that we get to adjust and apply the effects. So to create a profile Go into your project menu here, right click, go to create, and then post processing profile. I'm just going to call mine test for now. You can see that's it here. Now go back to your main camera and simply drag it in. So there we go. We've set up the entire system. It's so very easy. To start applying effects, click on your profile once more. And you'll see on the side here we have all the effects. Just click on which ones you want, and then click again to expand to get extra options. To install the version 2.0, the post processing stack, we're going to need to navigate to Window, Package Manager, All, and then scroll down until you see Post Processing. So here it is here, and up the top here, just click Install. Right, so the files have now installed into the project. If we go to Packages down here, we can see there are all the files. So let's go back out and set it up for our scene. So click on your camera, and go to Add Component, and just simply type in Post Pro. And we're going to add the post process layer. Now expand that. Now the layer needs to be a unique identifier. When you install the package, post processing should be added to your layers. But if that does not appear, you can simply go up to the top here, click on layers, edit layers, and then type in your own layer. All right, so that's all we have to do in that little script part there. For the layer of the main camera, let's select Post Processing. So now we need to create an empty game object. To do that, navigate to Game Object, Create Empty. I'm just going to call this Pulse Volume and click on Add Component. And this time we're going to add the Post Process Volume. So there we go. This is asking for a profile like the previous version. And to do that, it is identical. So simply go into your project, right click. Create Post Process Profile. Yet again, I'm just going to call mine Test. Go back to your volume and drag in the profile. Now, this would also require a collider. You could do that with simply with a box and set it to trigger. And this would mean that whenever our camera comes into contact with this trigger, the effects will apply. However, if you want it to be global and apply regardless of the camera's position, navigate back onto the volume and click it's global. Alright so to apply effects, click on our profile once more and simply go to add effect. You can add what you want, I'm just going to add some color grading, expand that and then pick the values that you would like. Now I almost forgot but we also need to change the layer of this object to post processing as well. If we did not do this, it would not work. So if I go into the game view, 
go into our profile and start playing around some values, you can see we are updating our scene. HDR. HDR, which stands for High Dynamic Range, is not a post-processing stack feature. Rather, it is found in the camera settings. Enabling HDR will heighten the dynamic range of your visuals, which is the contrast between bright and dark areas, allowing for greater detail and clarity. Anti-Aliasing. Simply provides a smoother appearance to graphics by removing that awful pixelated look, by blending the colour of an edge with the colour of pixels around. However, Keep in mind, as the quality increases, so does the reduction in performance. Unity supports multiple anti-aliasing methods as follows. FXAA, Fast Approximation Anti-Aliasing, TAA, Temporal Anti-Aliasing, and SMAA, Subpixel Morphological Anti-Aliasing. FXAA is the cheapest technique and is recommended for mobile games or slower desktops and consoles. TAA is an advanced technique which uses a history of frames to create a buffer to smooth edges. It is more taxing than FXAA and is not recommended for mobile games. When enabling this method you will receive multiple adjustable values which includes Jitter spread, the diameter inside which jitter samples are spread. Basically the smaller values result in crisp output while large values result in more stable but blurred output. Blending stationary controls the percentage of history samples for objects with minimal movement. Larger values result in smoother output. Blending motion. Controls the percentage of history samples for active motion. Larger values will result in smoother output. Sharpen. In high frequency regions, TAA may induce a loss in detail. Sharpening alleviates such issues. SMAA. Works similarly to FXAA, however provides more accurate and cleaner results. As such, it is more intensive than FXAA and is recommended for desktops and consoles. For additional information about various anti-aliasing methods, I have linked a video by Science Studio below. Ambient Occlusion Approximates how much ambient lighting can hit a point on a surface. In other words, allows you to achieve more realistic lighting, so you almost always want this enabled. Now Unity provides two modes of ambient occlusion, including scalable ambient obscurance and multiple scale volumetric obscurance. SAO has a lower quality but provides greater control in providing adjustable radius and quality settings. MSVO is higher quality and is faster on desktop and consoles, and my personal recommendation, as I find that SAO tends to cause more issues such as conflicts with nature's shaders. Auto exposure or eye adaptation simulates how a real eye adjusts to differing light levels. Applying this effect can add greater depth to your scenes while also ensuring that areas can never be too dark or too bright. Now people often get confused with the exposure settings of the feature, so I will do my best to explain each component. Filtering is when the bright and dark areas of a frame are filtered to avoid extremely bright or dark pixels. Minimum EV is the minimum illuminance or darkness to consider for auto exposure to occur. The lower this value, the greater darker areas will be lit up when viewed. Maximum EV is the maximum illuminance or brightness to consider for auto exposure to occur. The greater this value, the darker bright areas will become when viewed. And finally, exposure compensation. This is kind of like the middle value used to provide the base exposure of the entire scene. Bloom recreates the fringing of light extending from the borders of bright areas seen in real-world cameras, which contributes to the illusion of an extremely bright light. The main area to consider are intensity, which enhances the strength of the bloom effect, and the threshold, which provides a level of brightness that an area must surpass for the bloom effect to apply. Dirt textures can also be applied to create the illusion of dust and smudges on the camera lens. Traumatic Aberration creates defects in colour along the boundaries that separate dark and bright parts of an image. Similar to a vignette, it can be used to draw attention to the centre of the screen. Colour grading is essentially applying filters to your visuals. At first, colour grading may seem complicated, however most of the settings are generally self-explanatory. For the most part, you will only be adjusting values in the white balance, tone and channel mixer. For the channel mixer, it is important to keep your adjustments subtle if you are aiming for realism. 
I will go over the components in more detail in the practical section of the video. Depth of field. Applies a blur to areas out of focus and is a great way to draw emphasis. Focus distance refers to the distance from the camera which is in focus, also known as the focal point. Aperture or V-stop in photography refers to how open a camera lens is to let light in. For unity, the lower the value, the greater the blur. Focal length in photography refers to the length between the lens and the film. A greater value will result in more blurring. Motion blur simulates the blurring of an image when objects are moving faster than the camera's shutter speed, which is the duration of time in which the sensor inside the camera is exposed to light. The smaller this value, the greater the blur. Sample count is the number of sample points considered when determining the blur. Higher values will result in greater quality, however it will decrease performance. Screen space reflections. Use the screen data to apply additional reflections to your scene. Commonly used for subtle reflections such as puddles or wet surfaces. This effect is expensive and will decrease performance. Therefore, this effect shouldn't be used for mobile applications. Maximum marked distance refers to the maximum distance that will be considered for applying reflections. Distance fade refers to the distance before fading occurs on the actual reflection. The vignette will fade reflections that are more closer to the screen edges. And finally, vignette, which is the darkening or reduction of saturation towards the edge of the screen, and is a great way to draw emphasis. Alright, so welcome to the practical section of the video. I've started off by making this quick scene, it didn't take too long, and all the assets I have used are also free. If you'd like to download them, I have left links in the description below. Now my plan for this scene is to create a very strong filtered effect, that way I can best show off the power of the post-processing stack. Now keep in mind, I would usually apply such effects during the construction of the scene, however for the sake of this tutorial, I am doing so now. So to get started I'm just going to go over to my main camera and apply some anti-aliasing. I'm going to select SMAA and put it on high quality. Now next step is to go to window, rendering and lighting settings. This brings up the lighting panel which I'm going to drag over here. Now what I want to do is add a fog, so I just scroll down and select fog. Now, it's very subtle but I'm going to add a slight pink effect. Barely see it actually. I'm going to select it to maybe 2. There we go, that seems like a nice value. If I toggle it on and off, you can see the effect, especially here in the front. So, the next step is to create the profile. So, I'm going to go to create post processing profile. I have two because I have both versions installed, but I know that the second one is the version 2.0. And I'm just going to call mine tutorial and then drag it on to my post-processing volume. Oop, need to go to Inspector. There we go. So now we can start applying effects. What I like to start off with is Ambient Occlusion. So let's select that and tick all the values. Now, Intensity, what I tend to do is I don't have a set value to go to, rather I tend to just play around with it until I find something I like. And you can especially see the effects here and here and it really adds depth to the scene. So, I reckon... A little bit stronger than that, maybe 1.5. See how that looks? That looks pretty good. So now let's go up to here and increase the thickness of the shadow. So I reckon increasing it makes it look even better. That's probably a bit too strong, so let's go near 2. Yeah, around there, so let's go 2.12. There we go. Seems fine. If I turn off ambient only, you can see it becomes a lot stronger. From here it actually looks alright, especially with um, the grass and everything. You can see in this view it looks awful. So I'm just going to keep it on. It's more precise and I think looks a little bit more realistic this way. So, next effect is some bloom. So this will just brighten up the scene and make it a little bit more inviting. So yet again, 
just take all the values and we'll go to intensity check on one that didn't make a difference that's because our threshold seems to be a little too high so let's just decrease this by half and then add one you can see it just brightens up the sky one a little bit brighter how about two yeah i'm quite happy with that so i'll leave it on that now soft key this is kind of the spread of the bloom effect it's actually quite subtle to see here but I'm just gonna leave it at 350 so if I turn it on and off you can see it makes a drastic effect even all of these if I turn them on and off already it really transforms the scene alright so next step is let's add some emphasis through some depth of field now I've already measured up the focal point, which is going to be this arch, which becomes a circle in the reflection, which is really nice. That's at 50. Now, if I decrease the aperture here, you'll see the blurring effect gets stronger. You can see that that stays in focus because that's where the focal point is. Now, that's probably a bit too strong. So, I reckon, yeah, about about three seems fine for me. Now increasing the focal length will blur again, but with this one you can see there's quite a sharp difference and that doesn't look too nice. So I'm just going to decrease one to 100, maybe 115, 117, yeah like that. So you can see here it blurs kind of the front water here, the bushes here, and a tiny bit at the back and it just draws your attention to the circle which is what I want. Now that's essentially all the setup for quite a realistic scene, that's probably all I would do. But I want to show off the color grading, which can really transform the scene. Now, I'm going to make a pink filter effect. And you could do that in many ways. I could use the trackballs down here and just drag it up to pink. And you can see already it gives it a slight pink hue. But I'm going to actually do that with the tint. So if I drag the tint back and forth, you can see that it adjusts the colors. It's a very easy way to apply the filter effect. I'm just going to go 50. That seems quite nice actually. And I want to brighten up the scene, so I can do that with the exposure. I just select one. Ooh, okay, that's a bit, a bit too bright. We'll halve that. Yep, that seems a lot better. So also what I like to adjust is saturation and contrast. So contrast makes the black and whites more defined, as you can see, I'll put it on max, um, I'm just going to put it on 1, maybe 1.5, 4, yeah that seems fine for me, and saturation makes the various colours pop more and become more vibrant, so if I really bump it up you can see how it affects the scene, it's kind of like the juicy effect in Halo if you remember that back in the day, so I'm going to chuck it on, what should I put it on, 1 maybe, I'll try with that first. Okay, that's really subtle, but I kind of like that because if I start putting it up too much, it looks a bit too cartoony for me. I'm just going to leave it there. Now, the scene looks fine to me how it is, so I'll probably just leave it like that. The other effects do very subtle work. Actually, we could add screen space reflection. It's not going to make too big of a difference because we don't really have any extremely reflective properties or materials in our scene but it will still help add like it'll just make better lighting and make the scene look a lot more realistic so let's put on overkill because it's a very small scene and let's just toggle it on and off ah yeah you can see it's darkening up areas and even in the background here you can see it affects up here now it looks a lot better with the screen space reflection, so we'll leave that in. And I almost forgot, but we need a vignette. This will really emphasize that circle piece and just draw your attention to it. You can see I've centered this arch perfectly in the middle, and this waterline here is also half of the screen. So that way, so that's just composition techniques and it just draws your eye directly there. I'm considering making another tutorial talking about the art of techniques that go into designing. So composition, the golden ratio, all that kind of stuff. It's really interesting and it can really make the scenes look so much better. But 
I'm going off on a tangent, let's do this, vignetting. So my favourite setting in vignetting is the smoothing. That smooths it out, most people kind of leave it and tend to just use the intensity. If I bring it up like that, it creates really sharp edges. And I don't really like that effect, I prefer when it smooths out. So you can see that it's a lot more subtle and it just draws your attention there. Because if it wasn't smooth, I find it too distracting looking at these sharp lines, but no, that's just me. So I'm going to put the intensity quite low actually, because I'm going to smooth it out a lot. So we'll try it out with 0.25 at first. And we'll smooth this, keep smoothing, keep smoothing, keep smoothing. I'm looking at the corners to see the saturation. <laughs> actually yeah, I reckon one's fine. Just turn it on and off. Whoa. Makes a big different difference. Alright, so that's essentially it. I would call that done now. Now if we toggle on and off all the effects, you can see just how much power the post-processing has. It really transforms the scene. Even this looks a lot more 3D as if you can enter it. Whereas this looks flat, it looks boring, it looks dry almost, there's no vibrant colours. So, that's it. We're all done. We have transformed the scene. I think it looks so much better. Now, you probably noticed that I don't have a set way of applying post-processing. I simply play around with values until I find something that I like, and I encourage that same behaviour for your own scenes. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, make sure to like and subscribe, and hopefully you have learned something new and gained a useful insight to how I go about my own scenes. With that being said, I'll see you in the next one.